After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' aide, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I am about to give to them, to the Israelites. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Early in the morning, Joshua and all the Israel set out from Shittim and went to the Jordan, where they camped before crossing over. Joshua said to the Israelites, Come here and listen to the words of the Lord your God. This is how you will know that the living God is among you. Now then, choose twelve men from the tribes of Israel, one from each tribe. And as soon as the priests who carry the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, set foot in the Jordan, its waters flowing downstream will be cut off and stand up in a heap. But when the people broke camp to cross Jordan, the priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant went ahead of them. Now the Jordan was at flood stage all during harvest. Yet as soon as the priests who carried the Ark reached the Jordan and their feet touched the water's edge, the water from upstream stopped flowing. It piled up in a heap a great distance away. So the people crossed over opposite Jericho. The priests who carry the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stopped in the middle of the Jordan and stood on dry, dry ground while all Israel passed by until the whole nation had completed the crossing on dry ground. Now when all the Amorite kings west of the Jordan and all the Canaanite kings along the coast heard how the Lord had dried up the Jordan before the Israelites until they crossed over, their hearts melted in fear, and they no longer had the courage to face the Israelites. At that time, the Lord said to Joshua, Make flint knives and circumcise the Israelites again. So Joshua made flint knives and circumcised the Israelites at Gebeth Haraloth. Now this is why he did so. All those who came out of Egypt, all the men of military age, died in the wilderness on the way after leaving Egypt. All the people that came out had been circumcised, but all the people born in the wilderness during the journey from Egypt had not. The Israelites had moved about in the wilderness 40 years until all the men who were of military age when they left Egypt had died, since they had not obeyed the Lord. And after the whole nation had been circumcised, they remained there where they were in camp until they were healed. Then the Lord said to Joshua, Today I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. So the place has been called Gilgal to this day. On the evening of the 14th day of the month, while camped at Gilgal on the plains of Jericho, the Israelites celebrated Passover. Now the gates of Jericho were securely barred because of the Israelites. No one went out and no one came in. Then the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have delivered Jericho into your hands, along with its king and its fighting men. March around the city once with all the armed men. Do this for six days. Have seven priests carry trumpets of ram's horns in front of the ark. On the seventh day, march around the city seven times with the priests blowing the trumpets. When you hear them sound a long blast on the trumpets, have the whole army give a loud shout. Then the wall of the city will collapse and the army will go up, everyone straight in. The word of the Lord. Let us pray. <coughs> O Lord, help us to hear what you have done for your people in the past. 
Help us to hear it as a promise for what you will do for us. In Christ we pray. Amen. One of the great big advantages and gifts of this study you're doing is it allows you to place your life, if you choose to do so, in the great big story of God. And it is a big story. And the truth of the matter is we need big stories. We need stories bigger than our own life. We need stories bigger than our own neighborhood. We need big stories to live into, big stories to give us a sense of how the world works, big stories to tell us what values we can trust and believe in as we work through our lives. When I was growing up, I wasn't thinking about big stories, but when I was growing up, I was learning, even without knowing it, that my life was part of a whole ring, concentric ring of stories. There was my family, my parents, my older brother, my older sister, and my younger brother. That was a story I was a part of. And on summers, especially when we would go into Iowa and we would go up to Minneapolis and we would gather with, with my extended family, all kinds of uncles and aunts and cousins and grandmas and grandpas, I learned there was a larger story that my immediate family story fit into. We were Presbyterians. We went to church every Sunday. Every Sunday. <laughs> we were part of that story. We were in the Midwest. That was an important part of the country, I was told. And we were part of the United States of America. Now, when I was growing up in the 40s and 50s, I know that's a long time ago, but when I was growing up in the 40s and 50s, it meant a great deal to grow up in the United States of America. This was right after the Second World War. We came out of that war victorious in a great battle with our allies. We came out of that war as leaders in the world with our allies. And even as a child, I was told at home and I was told in school the, the stories of what this great nation was doing, how we helped to found the United Nations in San Francisco, part of this country, how we helped rebuild Europe through the Marshall Plan, how we helped to rebuild Japan, how there was this program called the GI Bill that allowed two of my uncles who'd fought in the war to go to college. My parents never got to college, but here were two of my uncles able to go to college. And then as I was older, there was a civil rights movement, which was a big step forward in this country's greatness. And then men on the moon, for heaven's sakes, it was a big story. It was great to be part of it. Somewhere along the line, not just in the last few years, somewhere along the line, maybe Vietnam, maybe Watergate, at least our national story started shaking and breaking up. In the 1980s, Rollo May, a therapist, started noticing some common themes in the stories he was being told by the people who were his patients. Increasingly in the 80s, he heard people talking about their lives as though they were completely on their own. They were somehow unrooted or uprooted. Their lives weren't connected to larger stories. This isn't his analogy, but it was as though people were discovering they were little Lego pieces, not snapped onto other things. So he wrote a book, and the book was entitled A Cry for Myth. It was published in 1991. And in the book, he basically says we all need larger stories, bigger than our own life. He said because people have lost their larger stories, their national stories, and even religious stories, and who knows what other stories, that's the reason, he said, why... We have such a rise in drug addiction and 
That's why in 1991 he writes, cults were becoming so important. And that's why in the late 80s, suicide rate among young people went up so dramatically. And, and that's why depression spread into all ages of our society. People had somehow fallen out of larger stories. Well, one of the stories that is large is this story you're studying and we're all a part of. It is the story of God's work. Not of God's watching, but of God's work. God is a God who rolls up God's sleeves and gets into life and into the messes of it and guides God's people along. In this particular week, you come to the book of Joshua, a wonderful book. And the texts before us help us to understand how this is a very important step in the great big story of God. It's important especially because way back at the beginning with Abram and Sarai, God had promised the people land. He said, I'll give you land, and on that land you'll have descendants, and, and the descendants will be more than the stars. And it took them a long time to get there. Abram and Sarah and their family, all their flocks and herds, they left their land, they left their home, and they became homeless. And they were, as one of their early creeds puts it, wandering Arameans. And though they settled for a while, they weren't home yet. And they certainly weren't home when they were slaves in Egypt. And they weren't home on the Exodus but when they get to Joshua, they get home. They arrive. And the promise God had made comes true. This is a huge moment. It's also a huge moment because after Moses, I'm sure the people were wondering, who follows Moses? Well, who on, who on earth could follow Moses? But God had that taken care of. God had that figured out. After Moses, there would be Joshua. And just as Moses had people helping him, Joshua would have people helping him. It was all part of this great plan. And as you'll see in the coming weeks, and probably already know, after Joshua, there are all those judges. And after those judges, there are all those kings and all those prophets, on and on and on. And then there is Jesus Christ, and then there are disciples. And after the disciples, and along with the disciples, there are people forming the church and creating the church and spreading the church. And it goes on to the establishment of the Eastern Church and the establishment of the Western Church. And God keeps the story rolling along. And there's the Reformation, and the story keeps rolling along. And it rolls along until 2017, and it lands right here in Douglas with us. We are every bit as much a part of the story as Joshua is, and every one of you is as much an important part of that story as Joshua was. God is always calling leaders, and God is always gathering people to do God's work. This isn't the end of the story. It's not where it begins, but it's a crucial time. And the big event, the really big event that is before us today and before you is really two events, crossing Jordan and the Battle of Jericho. And notice when it is time to cross Jordan, God doesn't say to the Israelites, well, there's Jordan, over is the other side, that's your land, go ahead, cross when you want to. God doesn't say, oops, the water's pretty high and pretty strong. Why don't you build boats? God doesn't say, well, the water is strong. This isn't a very good time, I guess. Let's wait till late summer when the river is lower. God says, even with the river flowing strongly, we're going now. And God commands that there will be 12 men who are commissioned as priests for this specific task to walk into the Jordan River <coughs> carrying on a platform the Ark of the Covenant. There's some debate over the years what different things might have been in the Ark at different times. 
but certainly there were the stone tablets from Moses. There may even at this time be the rod of Aaron that budded miraculously in front of Pharaoh. And there might have been some leftover manna that they had saved as a reminder of the, of the manna they were given during the Exodus. These things were in this what at the time was simply a box. And the Lord God said to Moses or said to Joshua to tell these men, you go into the river, go into the river while it's still flowing. And it will stop, and the people can cross. There's a little picture into obedience here. The men standing by the banks of the Jordan River were not told to wait until the water stopped. They were to step into the river while the water was flowing. Then God stopped the water. Sometimes... God is ready to do mighty things on our behalf, but sometimes God needs to see that we're willing to take a step also. A step before the evidence is in. A step before the deliverance happens. So the priests go in, it dries, and the people cross. But the main point is they led with the ark. That went first. It was God's way of telling them, follow me. Just as God had had them following God through all the exodus, God wanted to be sure they understood they were following God across the river. So the ark goes first by God's plan, by God's will, and they follow and they get home. But now, now there's Jericho. Now there's a group of people who don't want them there. And now we have a huge dilemma about the text. Scholars who have studied the area of Jericho, archaeologists who have studied it for decades, discovered a long time ago, though it's rarely talked about, that at the time when Joshua and the people crossed Jericho, or crossed the Jordan, Jericho wasn't a big city. It wasn't a walled city. It didn't have a big army. That's what we've all been taught. That's what we sang about in that wonderful old song. Joshua about the battle of Jericho, Jericho, Jericho. That's all you get. <laughs> Evidently, while it's very hard to date these events... Joshua didn't post anything on Facebook. Well, it's very hard to know when they crossed, and it's very hard to know just what was the city like, the city of Jericho, or the village of Jericho, or the town of Jericho. It wasn't this massive walled city. So what do we do with that? Especially if we've never heard this before. Well, one of the reactions can always be, well, I believe that everything in the Bible comes from God and I'm to believe everything in the Bible and that's it. I don't care about science or discoveries. The other extreme example is to say, well, if you can't trust the Bible about things like that, then how can you trust the Bible about anything? I don't care about the Bible. Thank heavens as these kind of debates have gone on for centuries, there are thousands if not millions of Christians who have found a middle way. And that is the way of learning how to discern the difference between those words in Scripture that come from God and those words in Scripture that are mostly coming from people and carry the flawed information that people in biblical times had about their world. In the middle of the 1800s, Charles Hodge, who was a, a great leader of old school orthodoxy in the Presbyterian and Protestant church, came up with a way of trying to make that distinction. He was trying to make a case for the infallibility of Scripture, 
and avoid the trap of it being inerrant, that is, without error. And what he said was, we have to keep in mind the difference between what biblical writers believed and what biblical writers knew. Biblical writers believed in their God, and what they have to tell us about God is reliable and truth for our lives. But what they knew about their world was often flawed. It wasn't created in six days. Earth wasn't the center of the universe. You're probably familiar where there's a long litany of passages that aren't accurate scientifically or biologically, historically. But the Bible is still full of inspired truth from God. That's why Bible study is so important. That's why studying Scripture, looking into Scripture, digging into Scripture, is such an invaluable part of being Christian. So what's going on here? Well, for one thing, it needs to be said that between the time of the Battle of Jericho, whatever kind of place it was, and the time when the written record was finally established and, and finished with editing, was 600 years. That's a long time. That's a long time for different versions of this event to go around. That's a long time for embellishments for the best reasons possible because this was such a huge event to be added to the text. But finally, this became the story, accepted in Israel, written into the sacred scripts of Scripture. And it's probably not historically accurate, but it is spiritually accurate. It is theologically accurate, because what it tells us is the most important thing in the story. Regardless of what kind of city or village Jericho was, the message is, God led the people to victory. That's the message. That's the infallible truth. Somehow, after the battle was done, the people knew God had given them their victory, and that's what they celebrated and passed on to succeeding generations on and on and on. So out of this great big story... And out of this big event, Jordan and Jericho, comes a big message. The message is obedience leads to praise. When we are obedient to God, God will lead us to experiences of deliverance where we will praise God. That's what God did all during the Exodus. That's what God did as they crossed Jordan. That's what God did at the Battle of Jericho. Obedience leads to praise. If we follow God and trust God, God will bring us home. And we will end up praising God. Now, as mentioned earlier, this is Pentecost Sunday, and Pentecost doesn't exactly fit into this text, but in a way it does. Because obedience is hard. It is hard. Hard work. We struggle to be obedient and we don't always get it right. And God knows how we struggle. God knows our frame. God knows our specs. God knows the program. God wrote the program. And so God chose in time to send the Holy Spirit to be a spirit that comes into us to help us fight the good fight for obedience. As Paul says in Romans, God pours the Spirit into our lives so that we can believe and can follow and be led to praise. Paul, in the same letter, says circumcision is no longer important. It was for the Israelites. It's no longer important in the church. What's important is the Spirit of each person and the willingness for that spirit to receive the Holy Spirit. Obedience leads to praise. 
Let's pray. Almighty God, we give you thanks for all the ways in which you speak to us, for the meal we are about to receive. Grant that we may turn to you with open and trusting hearts, and to Scripture with open and trusting hearts, as we find your words for us and your life for us. In Christ we pray. Amen. Without the Holy Spirit, this is just bread and wine. Without the Holy Spirit, these are maybe precious, but somehow empty words. But with the Spirit, this becomes a sacrament. With and because of the Spirit, this becomes a sacred meal. And we, we are invited to this. Jesus extends the invitation. And Jesus wants the honor of your presence at this meal. Let us pray. Almighty God, we pray for you to bless these elements and bless us as we receive them. By your Holy Spirit, set them apart from common uses to a sacred purpose. So that as we receive this bread and juice, we may in spirit and in truth receive your spirit and the living presence of Christ. And have our life and faith renewed, washed, and strengthened. In Christ we pray. Amen. The night of his arrest, our Savior took bread, and when he had blessed it, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner, our Savior took a cup, and having given thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood which is shed for you. Drink of this, all of you. As often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord until he comes again. The feast of God for the people of God let us keep the feast. Now may the Lord bless us and keep us. May the Lord make his face to shine upon us and be gracious unto us. May the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon us and grant us his peace, now and forever. Amen. <laughs>